No, I think I, I I didn't have the I don't care. I think I was I was pretty scared to be honest. I, I was actually really frightful about dying, and I, I was I actually thought I was going to die. Like I really did, I, and that was kind of what was the biggest fear for me. So, and it was more so when I had to go in for the second heart surgery during the when I went into the first heart surgery, everything happened so fast. And I just, and the way they were all positive about it, they were like, you know, we can fix you to be okay. And I was like, all right, let's just get it done because this sounds scary. Let's just go as fast as possible. So I was just, you know, trying to get everything done quick and just tell myself that I'll be okay. But then after I'd recovered for three months and then to get another call for them to say, we need to come back and do this surgery again. That's when I thought, okay, this is going to be some ongoing bull that's going to, you know, that's going to be a problem for me. And then I remember that after that phone call and it was, I'd actually gone back to work for one day as well. It was my first day back to work after three months. And I came home that afternoon to the call. And so I, I remember when that happened, I was just shot. I was just, I felt so scared and, and fearful. I thought I've got to go do this whole surgery again. I've got to go under general anesthetic. They're going to go into my heart. Like I'm not going to make it. Listen to the Vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm happy to welcome all the way from Australia, Jai Bozevsky. I got it. I got it. You got it, man. You got it. (laughs) Sweet. (laughs) Now, you are a life coach and uh, fitness expert, correct? Correct, yes. Sweet. What got you involved in all that? Interesting story, actually. I I wasn't always in this industry. Um, I... When I left high school, I got into the IT industry. That was, you know, I finished school in 1998. So that was right at the beginning of that IT boom, particularly in Sydney, Australia. And um, I was working for a company, just doing some part-time work with them. And they had a traineeship available. And that just turned into a 13-year career in the IT industry. And um, yeah, that's sort of how I began. But then I guess the last four or five years of that, uh, I realized it wasn't for me. I I wasn't enjoying it. I didn't really feel like I was adding any value to the world. I was spending most of my time, you know, just with my head into in a computer or configuring a server or just doing stuff that I just felt just wasn't important. Mm. And I wanted to do more in the world. And um, then something happened that completely changed everything for me. And that was that I had a cardiac arrest. So I had uh, something wrong with my heart. I was playing a game of basketball with my friends. I'd just come off a big night of drinking. It was my friend's birthday and I was hungover. And then the next morning I was playing basketball, sweating it out and just pushing my body to the next level. And then, yeah, my heart just started going like really elevated, but irregular at the same time. Mm. And um, so I went home and relaxed and had a shower and chilled out and my heart rate did not come down. I was still sweating as though I was playing a game of sport like five hours later. And, um, and I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. And then my family was saying to me, we've got to go to the hospital. And I was like, no, no, I'll be fine. Like, I just need to chill out. Like maybe I've, I've got anxiety or something. And um, I was just trying to like play it down. But seven hours had gone by and, and my heart rate was just wild. And so my family were freaking out and they're like, you know, we've got to go, we've got to go to the hospital just, just to make sure. And then eventually they convinced me. So we went out to the hospital and as soon as I got in there, like, just shit went wild. Basically they thought I was on drugs initially and they're like, what drugs are you on? And they were like drilling me on, on that. And like, what have you had? We know you've had some kind of substance. And so I had to convince them that I hadn't. And then um, once, once they believed me, finally, they said, okay, we're going to give you a drug. It's funny. They're saying what drugs you on? And then they go, we're going to give you a drug. Um, (laughs) They said, we're going to give you a drug to stop your heart and it'll restart your heart and the arrhythmia um, issue will go away. And then I said, okay, let's go. Cause I was at this point, I was getting very anxious. And so they gave me this drug. It was fire injection. And, um, and then I just had a complete adverse reaction to it. I fell into a coma. That's the last thing I remember. Oh, so man. I was in a, yeah, I was in a non-responsive coma. They put a, a ventilator in my throat and that lasted for eight minutes. Meanwhile, my heart rate is just climbing and climbing. So after the eight minutes, I went into a cardiac arrest. I flatlined. I was clinically dead for three minutes while they were trying to paddle me back to life with the defibrillator. And eventually on the second um, defibrillation, they got me back. And I remember jumping up at that moment 
And I didn't realize I had this ventilator in my throat. So I just, I just had this feeling that I was just projectile vomiting everywhere, but really I was just choking on this damn thing. So my, my natural instinct was I just grabbed this thing and just ripped it out. And they all lost their shit because they thought um, that I'd torn my trachea or something. And so they were freaking out about that. So they pushed me back down onto the bed and they got the, um, x-ray blanket and they were x-raying my chest to see if i'd done any damage from ripping this ventilator out and then um in that moment i remember just checking in with myself and i remember asking myself is my heart doing that weird thing and it wasn't and then so as soon as i realized that it wasn't i was like i'm okay now so i just kind of relaxed and i just remember being the most exhausted i've ever felt and i don't know if it was from being shocked or just the whole process but i was completely exhausted i could barely open my eyes so anyway, I was in um, I was in the hospital for another four or five days because they didn't want to let me go until they figured out what happened and and what caused this. So they were taking my blood and doing ECGs and just monitoring me. And then after about four or five days, the um, cardiologist came in and he said to me, oh, "We think you've got this this heart condition that we can treat." either by two ways we can put you on medication for the rest of your life which was an absolute no for me and or we could um, perform heart surgery and repair it permanently and then you don't have to be on medication and then you can just live, go and live your life and so i said okay let's do the heart surgery because that seems to be the better long-term thing so um so I was in this waiting room. I was in. Uh, I was waiting for my heart surgery. I had to wait another week or so. And I remember being up in that cardiac ward. And I was in this room with all these other men that were also waiting for heart surgery. And all these men, they were in their 50s and 60s. They were all overweight. They all looked terrible. You could tell that they didn't have healthy lifestyles. And, um, and the therapists were coming in every day and they just pulled the little, you know, the shower screen curtain across for privacy. And then they'd have a full on therapy session with these guys actually preparing them for death. And it, it, it really blew my mind. And it was quite like shocking for me to hear that and talking to these guys and ask, asking them questions like, you know, have you thought about, you know, um, you know, if you don't make it and all this kind of stuff. And I was just thinking all these things. And I thought, to, and looking in the room, I thought to myself, none of these men need to be here. They look like they're all here because they haven't taken care of themselves. And in that moment, I just had this insight that prevention is the only cure. And we need to work on prevention. And then that's when I thought to myself, if I can get myself healthy, heal my, heal my body, get through this surgery, get out of here, I'm going to change my life. I, I didn't like what I was doing in the IT world. I wanted to get out. I just didn't know what to do. And in that moment, I thought to myself, I'm going to get into the fitness industry. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, help people get healthy. I'm going to be this prevention guy. So I basically did that. So over that time I had the surgery and then, um, I recovered for three months and then I had to go back and have the surgery again because they they thought that they stuffed it up somehow. So that ended up turning into two heart surgeries and six months of recovery. But then once I got through all that and um, that was really my lowest point because I actually thought I was going to die. Like I legit thought that I was not meant to be alive at that point. I was only 27 years old. I'm 43 this year. So that was back in 2008. And um, so I went through like this very low point. And I think that although it was the hardest time of my life, that's actually what created everything that I needed, the courage, the insight, the mindset, everything that I needed to move forward and change my life. I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not had that really rough experience and really hit that rock bottom. So I'm grateful in a way for it all that it all happened because it's led me to where I am today. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it was very tough. And so so once I recovered, I went back to work to basically quit my job. And then I signed up to do uh, um, all these courses. I did my diploma in life coaching and um, the personal training certification. And then I just quit and I started my own business. I didn't even go and work for anybody. I just thought I'm just going to do everything on my own because one of the things I wanted to do a big part of my life was to work for myself and be an entrepreneur and just do my own thing. Cause you know, I'm not good with authority. I don't like answering the people. I just follow my own, you know, my own beat of my own drum. And um, so I thought I'm going to do this on my own. So without any industry experience or anything, I just started my own business. I opened a gym and, um, and it thrived for up until 2021 from 2010 to 2021. I ran this epic gym in Sydney, Australia, and just had, 
amazing success, worked with thousands of people, transformed lives, saved lives, saved marriages, like just next level wow. stuff. Yeah, really amazing stuff and um, very grateful. And in the first six months of starting that business, I met my wife who um, also basically, she was working in an office environment as well, working in a bank. And she used to run like boot camp classes for free for her friends. And I could just see that she would be so amazing to work with me. So when I'd met her, I was basically courting her but at the same time I was thinking to myself you need we need to work together so I said quit your job <laughs> come and work with me get this personal training certification let's do this and so she just had the faith in me and she went for it as well she quit her job she did the personal training certification she jumped on board and then as soon as she came in we just went like that and wow. this the, the synchronicity with us too and just having that I think the male and the female energy it just works so well and our gym, it wasn't like a normal gym where people just rock up and train. It was a personal training studio. We, we rented out this old warehouse, this old dirty warehouse, and we just converted it into our space. And so we just ran group classes and one-on-one -on -one personal training. And, um, and so it was a really tight community and it just did really well. And so we did that all the way up until COVID. And then COVID just came in like a sledgehammer into our area. So we were yeah. living in... Western Sydney at that time. And Western Sydney has a huge multicultural population, particularly people from the Middle East. And the people, if you if you know much about like the Lebanese community and the Turkish community and, and these types of communities, they're not very compliant either. And um, especially when it comes to all the, the regulations with COVID. And so it seemed as though the, um, the government, the councils, the police, whoever wanted to make an example of our area. So they cracked down very, very hard on our area in particular. So if you go, if you went into the, the more, you know, um, richer areas or the, the, you know, the better areas, um, there was a lot more freedoms out there. And, you know, we just felt really like, you know, hard done by in that regard. And so, you know, they were standing at the front of the supermarkets and they were giving us $1,000 fines if we didn't have a mask on. They were, they were actually undercover. They were walking through the shopping mm -hmm. aisle, through the aisles, looking for people. They had helicopters going above, you know, with PA speakers, scaring the kids with, that were in the park. Go home, go home, this kind of stuff. They were knocking on the business doors to see if businesses were open. We didn't care. We just shut the blinds and we ran our business. We just completely <laughs> didn't care. And, um, but it, it got very, uh, very stressful. And we realized that, you know, we didn't want the, the health regulations coming, knocking on our door, checking to see if we're social distancing and doing all this crap. So we just thought, you know what, let's just, let's move on to the next phase of our life. So we decided to pack it all in in 2021 and move nine hours north to a beautiful beach town called Kingscliff, um, which is not a city. It's a, just a small little beach town. And we moved our business to online. So we've been doing online um, coaching and training um, for the last sort of year. And um, just loving our life. The beach is across the road. We've got an awesome routine. And, and now we're helping. Um, we can actually help even more people because there's no limitation to, you know, our little demographic area. We can help people from all over the world. So we've got clients in Canada, clients in US, clients all over Australia. And it's just been fantastic. Wow. That's an incredible story, man. Yeah. I, I know that that feeling with the, you know, the, the heart problems. Yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to kind of share with you what happened to me because it yeah. seems like everything about our lives is almost 10 years apart for everything. Wow. Because uh, I graduated in 89. <laughs> right. And uh, I'll be 53 this year. Yeah. And I had my heart attack when I was 36. Wow. Um, I I started drinking and doing drugs when I was about 12. And just, it got worse and worse as the years went on. I'm, I'm, I was a pretty hard drinker. And I, I didn't care. I ate whatever. I, mean, I put on a lot of weight and ended up, uh, I, I had my heart attack, but weird thing is is the the time that led up to it it was about two weeks before i noticed that i was starting to get these headaches and i'd, I'd stop drinking for a little bit because i didn't like to drink while i had a headache and i noticed that the headaches would go away and then i'd drink a beer and then the headaches would come back 
So like, well, maybe it's just the, the beer. So I quit drinking for a little bit. And then I just noticed that I was getting really, really tired. I'm just almost lethargic. And I, I worked this weird shift. Um, you, they would have one crew that would come in in the afternoon and work until late in the evening. So my shift was three to 11. And usually I'd sleep in in the mornings and, you know, kind of lay around until it was time to go to, to work. So I thought that, you know how it is when you just lay around, you're lazy and you don't, you, you just kind of lose your energy. I thought that's what it was. So this one particular day, I decided I'm going to get up and I'm going to do stuff around the house, stay, stay active. So I don't feel that. I did a, like an hour or two worth of work and felt like I had worked a 12 hour shift or something and I went back to bed and I slept until it was time to get up and go to work. I'm on my way to work. And it almost felt like I um, I was stoned or something. You know, that euphoric kind of fuzzy feeling that you get. And I didn't feel good, but I was determined I was going to work. I didn't want to lose my overtime. I get there. My boss is trying to tell me what I need to do for the evening. And then it started to sound like his voice was going away from me. And then it looked like I was walking into a tunnel with the, the light around me was just getting darker. And later they told me my eyes had rolled up in my head. I, I, I felt my heart like it was going to jump out of my chest. Couldn't breathe. You know, I'm sitting there going, <laughs> you know, and luckily the EMS is like right next door to us. So they rushed in and sure enough, I was, I was having a heart attack right there. They gave me the nitroglycerin, the whole nine yards. And to make a long story short, I get to the hospital. They run tests on me. My blood sugar was over 600. My triglycerides were 1,500. And my, uh, my, uh, oh, my God, my blood pressure was like, it was just off the charts. Yeah. The doctor even looked at me and says, I don't know how you're still alive. Wow. And uh, so it, I thought that was it, you know, but for me, uh, I was like, I didn't care. I just feel like life wasn't going good anyway. So let me go. Uh, and, but got, you know, I started to lose weight and do all the stuff to better my life, quit the drinking and all that. I dropped like, I think it was it was like 60 pounds altogether. Wow. And, uh, but I mean, did you, did you just feel scared? I, I, I don't want this or were you like me and just like, I just don't care. Um, no, I think I, I, I didn't have the, I don't care. I think I was, I was pretty scared to be honest. I, I was actually really frightful about dying and I, I was, I actually thought I was going to die. Like I really did. I, and that was kind of, what was the biggest fear for me. So, and it was more so when I had to go in for the second heart surgery during the, when I went into the first heart surgery, everything happened so fast. And I just, and the way they were all positive about it, they were like, you know, we can fix you to be okay. And I was like, all right, let's just get it done because this sounds scary. Let's just go as fast as possible. So I was just, you know, trying to get everything done quick and just tell myself that I'll be okay. But then after I'd recovered for three months and then to get another call for them to say, we need to come back and do this surgery again. That's when I thought, okay, this is going to be some ongoing bullshit. That's going to, you know, that's going to be a problem for me. And then I remember that after that phone call and it was, I'd actually gone back to work for one day as well. It was my first day back to work after three months. And I came home that afternoon to the call. And so I, I remember when that happened, I was just shot. I was just, I felt so scared and and fearful, I thought I got to go do this whole surgery again. I got to go under general anesthetic. They're going to go into my heart. Like I'm not going to make it. So um, I thought to myself, I'm going to do it because if I don't do it, I'll probably die. So this is my best chance of survival. And so I remember I, I walked upstairs. I went into the shower, turned the shower on, and I just let all the emotion come out. 
and it just poured out of me. I was crying and crying and crying in there and I was doing the whole why me and, you know, this is like, I can't believe this is happening to me. And I, I just let all the emotions come out. And while I was in the shower, I said to myself, as, as soon as I turn this shower off, I'm turning off my emotions like a tap as well. And, and I'm not going to have these emotions all the way through, like up until the, the surgery, I'm just going to get it all done. So I stayed in there for a little bit longer and I just let it all come out, just got it all out. And I felt like that was a big part of the process as well. And um, once all that kind of happened, I put my hands on the, on the shower taps and I was just took a couple of breaths and I was like saying to myself, all right, like once this shower goes off, no more, no more crying, no more feeling sorry for yourself. So I took a breath, turned that shower off and then the emotions just stopped like that. I went to my family and then I said, look, I got this surgery booked in. It's going to be in six days or seven days or whatever it was. I said, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want you to bring it up. I don't want you to ask me any questions about it. I don't want to think about it. It's, it's happening. I've booked it in and, and that's that. And then they were supportive. They're like, yep, no worries. Like, let's go with it. So I got through that week and I didn't think, and even if like the slightest thought came into my mind, I just thought about something else. I just completely disregarded it. And that worked really, really well. And then even on the day, like in the car, driving to the hospital to have the surgery, I was just trying not to think about it. I was just pretending like it was a routine thing, you know, like I was just driving to work or something and um, went in there and just right up until that, that last minute. And then the, I remember the, um, the surgeon came in and then he's like, all right, Jai, so, you know, I want to go over the risks with you. And then I was like, don't even bother. You got me here now. I'm in this bed. You're about to cart me into the surgery room. I don't even want to know. And he's like, all right, we'll sign here then. <laughs> so I just signed away and then he took me in. And then the last thing I remember, they put the gas mask on me and told me to count, count down from 10. And then I woke up and, uh, and I was all good. And um, I just remember walking out of there feeling so relieved. And I just thought, Maybe, you know, like I did get out of this. I did, you know, I am meant to be alive. And that's when all of the positivity came because they were like, you know, you're hundred percent, you're fine, blah, blah, blah. And I went back and did tests over that next three months and did all the final checkups and everything. And the last time I saw the cardiologist, he was like, get out of here. I never want to see you again. And then that, <laughs> that was amazing to me. And, um, and, you know, the, I still had a little bit of fear because I hadn't done any exercise for six months. I hadn't got my heart rate elevated at all over that time. And I had an anxiety over it. And I said that to him. I said, like, whenever my heart does anything, like, goes up slightly, I get, like, I freak out. Right. And then he said, because of the experience that you had, he said, you're in tune so much more than the, the average person. He said, every single human being that's walking around today has an irregular heartbeat. He goes, but they just have no idea because they're not tuned into it and they don't, they don't even feel it. He goes, but because you're kind of like tapped into it and you're thinking about it, if your heart does the slightest little shudder, you'll notice it and you know it, it'll kind of maybe trigger you emotionally. He goes, so just don't worry, you're all good. And so I said, okay, that's great. And then, um, and then he put me on the stress test treadmill and like, and I had my reservations about that as well. I said like, you know, I've got some fears around this. And then he said, look, if anything happens, this is the place to do it because I'll save your life. Like no matter what happens, if the worst case scenario happens here, I will make sure that you are alive, that we save you. And I said, okay, that's great. So I went in there and got on the treadmill. They plugged me up with all of the you know, devices and everything and started running on this treadmill. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I don't want to carry this stress over myself. So I'm going to really, really push it and see what happens. So I just kept on saying to the lady, turn it up higher, turn it up higher. And I was going so fast. And I remember I was literally running as fast as I possibly could on that treadmill. It only lasted for about four or five minutes. And then she's like, yep, you're all good. And then I got off that treadmill. It was the first time my heart had gone up, you know, since the whole incident. And it came down like normal. Everything felt normal. Everything felt great. You know, I felt good. I, you know, had, had that little workout and um, yeah. And then they checked me out of there. And so after that, like I felt really, really positive. And that's when I really, my mind switched to like, all right, let's, let's like really strengthen your heart now. Let's strengthen your body. And that's when I started to research the nutrition side of things. I remember Googling like how to have a strong heart, like literally, and everything came back to go running, you know, do running and, and, this type of cardiovascular exercise. So 
I um I logged into I I looked up what the local um half marathons were in the area and there was a half marathon that was three months away, so I just signed up for it and I'd never done that before I'd only ever run like three kilometers in my whole life, and but I thought no nah, I'm just going to do this so I signed up for that for the accountability and then I that made me just go out and start running every single morning so I'd wake up at six a.m. And I just hit the pavement and I just go and run and I it just got further and further and further every day and um, led myself into that half marathon, got that half marathon done. And then by that time, I just thought to myself, well, if I can run a half marathon, then my heart's stronger than most people. Um, so, and it just went from there. And then the nutrition as well. I lost a lot of weight over that time. I went in, when it all happened originally, I was about 93, 94 kilos, which is probably like over 200 pounds. And then when I came out of it, I was about 76, 77, which is, you know, like 180. So maybe I lost like 20, 30 pounds over that time mm-hmm. and, uh, and just felt amazing. And, um, and so, yeah, so I was really, really adamant to survive. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't in that mindset that you were in that was like, fuck it, you know, like, let's just, uh, let's just, let's just die sort of thing. So, yeah, I imagine that was very tough for you to to have that feeling and go through that and just think that you didn't want to live. Yeah, so I was going through a real rough patch in my life. Um, you know, there was there was something that was going on. I could feel it like with my, my first wife. And when I was in the hospital, the whole time I was in there, she didn't come to visit me once. Shit. And I was, she kept telling me, oh, well, I have to work. And I'm thinking, you, you don't think that your job would understand that your husband just had a heart attack and, you know, he's in the hospital. Come check on him. Oh, but, you know, she was telling me she was training to be a manager and that, you know, she had to stay with the program. And when I got out of the hospital and started getting better, I found out that she was dating a younger man and she ended up leaving me for him. And my self-esteem was just, you know, she, she'd tell the kids all kinds of stuff about me. And, you know, I, I couldn't stay in a dirty house. And so I'd go and I'd clean and within an hour or so, it looked like I never touched it. And she would literally tell my kids to mess the place up after I cleaned it. Yeah. Right. So I just felt like, why am I even here? You know? Yeah. And it, it it took me when, you know, her leaving me was actually the best thing that ever happened to me because I got to know myself again and enjoy the things that I love. And you know how it is when you're with someone, you kind of lose yourself well i had totally lost who i was uh, basically all i was was a drunk <laughs> and then when i got away from the alcohol and the drugs and my head cleared up and all of a sudden life started looking so much different and then i met my wife that i have now we've been together eight years and she's encouraged me to get back on my spiritual path and she's encouraged me to chase my dreams which i never got that before and the the one thing that kind of knocked us down but hasn't stopped me and i was going to ask you about uh do you help people that uh, that are at all kinds of levels of uh you know their fitness because yeah i'm sorry go ahead go ahead yeah definitely um so Something that was big for me was getting people to start from the foundation from from zero. And mm-hmm. so the name of my business is Square One Fitness. So it's kind of a play on words to start from square one. Um, but it also was a very profound dream that happened not long after that whole um, experience with the near-death experience. And it was that um, I was in this this room and it had no walls, no ceiling, no floor. Everything was just pure white, white light. And there was groups of people around the area. And um, I was in my little group. And for each group, there was one person that was trying to solve a puzzle. And it appeared to me that it was their puzzle of their life that they were trying to un- 
decode. Mm. And I was that person that was trying to decode mine. And the puzzles were just these tiles, these square tiles. And it was almost like a crossword type thing. And so you had to try and figure out like where the, the, I guess the tile was that had the answer. And so I could see where I'd walked because the tiles were blue the where I'd walked and they were white where I hadn't. And so I'd gone up and then over here and then over here and then over here and up here or somewhere like that. And mm -hmm. I was confused. And every now and again, you'd hear like a commotion and then you'd look over and you'd see one of these groups where somebody had solved their little puzzle and everybody just stopped and they had like just this amazing love and energy um, and like people would cry for them and just have this amazing feeling. And as that happened, when they were standing on, when they'd solved that puzzle, they would evaporate into white light and then disappear. And then everybody would just go back to their puzzle again with a confused look on their face and the energy would just go back to the way it was. And that happened about two or three times in the dream. And then, and then every time it happened, I was like, all right, I've got to figure my puzzle out. And then, so I was standing on this, on this um, tile and I'm thinking to myself, I just got this thought that came to me and then it said, go back to square one. And then I was like, of course. And then it was almost like my intuition just said, of course, square one, like that makes so much sense. So then I walked back to the very first tile. And then as soon as I stood on that tile, I started to feel this energy come up through my feet and into my body. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I thought, Ooh, I think this is it. And then, so my, and then it was it. And then, so everybody stopped and started to look at me and everybody was like clapping and cheering and crying for me and stuff. And then I just felt this energy, this amazing, beautiful, like very, very powerful energy just vibrate within my body. And then as it was happening, I was like disintegrating. It was almost like particles were breaking up and I was like literally turning from like a, like a solid form into just like a, a ether almost or something. And then I would have, and I would evaporate and into this light. And so I, basically was just absorbed into this white light. And as that happened, the intensity of the energy was just magnificent. It was so powerful. And as that happened, and as I disintegrated into that white light, I woke up and it was almost similar to like the defibrillation when they brought me back to life. Mm -hmm. And so I woke up with this like buzzing energy and I noticed that I was crying not crying, but like water was coming out of my eyes, but without the crying. And I know that you can cry from happiness as well, but it wasn't even that. It was just, I, I just had water pouring out of my eyes and I was like, well, what's going on? Like that was intense. And then I'm wiping my eyes like this. And then I was like, okay, like I was crying. But then as I was, as I realized that I was crying, the water was still coming out after the fact that I'm like, wait a minute, it's still, it's still happening. What's going on here? You know? And I think it was just like a release of energy or something and, or, or I, I don't even know. And, and so, um, and that buzz just stayed with me for like a couple of minutes and I had to get out of bed and shake it off and drink some water. And I was just like, oh my God, like that was super intense. And then I got, my heart was racing as well, but not in a bad way. And then I got back into bed after I kind of settled down a bit and I was just thinking about the whole thing. And then I woke up the next morning and then I was thinking to myself, when I was back in high school, before I went into this, like I fell into that IT career because I got a traineeship. I used to work for this company answering telephones in, you know, part time. And then my boss, my manager said to me, go downstairs and talk to the manager in the IT department because he's they got traineeships for people and he might have something for you. And, and that's kind of how that happened. And so I had no interest or no desire to move, to go into the IT industry. I wanted to be a personal trainer when I was in high school. That was like the thing that I thought my career was going to be because mm -hmm. prior to that, I wanted to be a professional athlete. And then I realized by the time I was 18, I thought this isn't going to happen. And so I thought maybe fitness is going to be a great solution. So, um, so I was really interested in that. And then I kind of connected all the dots the next day. And then I thought maybe the whole square one thing is go back to what I originally wanted to do, which was go into the fitness industry and help people with their health and fitness. And so, and that's when all of the insight came and I was like, yep, this is, this is what, this has to be it. This is how we have to go ahead. And, um, and, and so that was kind of like the driver behind it all that just, it was that intuition. And since that time as well, I've had this intuition that has just, driven me and guided me where I don't doubt things anymore. Like when I just get this feeling and I just go, yep, this is the right thing to do. And then I just act on it really fast and it always ends up benefiting me. And um, going back to that energy, that, that vibrant energy, 
it's happened a few times, maybe like four or five times since. And actually it happened to me last night, the night before last night, it happened to me again. And I was just in bed and it was a lot more subtle, but I was just in bed. And then I just got this rush of energy that just came up from the bottom of my spine and it just went vroom, and just overtook my body. And all I could see was just white light everywhere. And it woke me up with my heart beating fast. And then, but it felt good. It was weird. And then it was just rushed. And then I just got up, went to the bathroom, drank some water, went back to bed and then I was okay again. But it's just it's bizarre. And I still to this day, don't quite understand what it is, but um, I don't know, some kind of guiding light, maybe some kind of, I don't know. I'm not, I really don't know. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. Definitely. Well, see, this is my problem um, because of my diabetes. Uh, and it'd been bad for so long i ended up getting a disease in my spine and it's my bones are deteriorating in my spine and so it it chews up my my discs and it also caused a lot of nerve damage because it's like walking into a cave in between my my spinal bones mm -hmm. it's, you know it's like you got stalactites and stalagmites going on And uh, I've already gone through a few surgeries and, you know, it's all kinds of craziness. But, I mean, I can't lift anything anymore. Um, yeah. I walk for about 10 minutes and then the pain gets pretty excruciating. And I usually push through just because I'm stubborn, but I, I pay for it. And, you know, it's two or three days. I can't hardly get up. And it's just, I, I don't know what else to do i mean they they gave me some it's kind of yoga style balancing exercises that you know it you know i, I count to like five most of the time that's about all i can handle but uh, there's got to be something more and i wondered if you if you knew of something else more i could do Yeah, definitely. I think that those yoga movements are definitely great. Um, something that could be good as well is to just reset your body with um, a, a fast. So a period of fasting. If you think about all of the ancients, all of the wise men, they all did those three things they did. They'd, they'd go on long treks to get enlightenment. They'd do long fasts to get enlightenment as well. And then they'd sit in silence as well. And so those were the three things that created enlightenment. But I think that doing these water fasts really regenerate the body on a deep spiritual level as well. And, um, you know, I'm of the belief that the body is self-healing and self-regulating. That's what my chiropractor always used to say to me as well. The body is self-healing and self-regulating. We just have to get out of the way. And so I believe that anything can be healed. And I think that the things that limit us is the subconscious mind because the subconscious mind has its belief systems that, this can or can't happen and whatever you your subconscious mind has locked in is is what we will manifest in our lives so i believe that if we can change that uh those belief systems and um create that belief of healing then that's the first step and then i think once we have that belief then that's when the solutions start to come to us um so um, a really interesting story that's just happened this week Um, my wife, she's been suffering with migraines for the last 20 years. Oh, And this is something, yeah, this is something that's actually been quite debilitating for her because one of the things that induces, well, there's two things that um, basically trigger a migraine for her. One of them is um, menstruation. And then the other one is exercise. And she's a personal trainer. So you can imagine, you know, being in this lifestyle, it's very, very tough. So there's a lot of exercises she can't do, a lot of workarounds she has to do. And um, so, yeah, it's been a battle, right? So, um, but the, the belief that both of us have had over this whole time is that there is a solution and that we can solve it. And um, so we just keep trying different things and just work on working on it, working on it, working on it. And we've had a bit of a breakthrough uh, of recent times. And um, she recently, just earlier this week, she went to a spiritual healer, which I can give you the details for. She does over the phone stuff. She's like local to this area. And um, so she sat down and had this session and she went in there with um, 
like with the intentions of um, seeing if she could get some answers about these migraines as to what's triggering them. Mm -hmm. But she didn't tell the healer anything. She just basically booked in the session and just went in there with, and the lady didn't know anything about, about her situation. And so she goes into this room and she's never, Kate's never done anything like this before either. So she goes into this session, she sits down and um, she doesn't say a word, but she goes in there. And as soon as she sat down, the the healer she just started going for it she just like took a deep breath and she just did her thing and then she just started laying it on her and she just was talking to her for a whole hour and telling her all this stuff and one of the things that we suspected could have been a cause of the the migraines because they started at around age 19 mm -hmm. um was um head trauma from sport because um she was a a uh, she used to play soccer and one of the things that she did she played on the backfield and she used to head the ball a lot and that was kind of like one of the thing that was like one of her things that she was really good at because a lot of the other girls were too scared to head the ball and so she would when the ball was coming even if it was kicked from the other side of the field she just wouldn't wouldn't she think about it she'd just go yeah. for it <laughs> yeah and um and so this lady she said to her like straight off the bat she's like you've um you've got some kind of um head trauma that's creating a problem for you most likely from a sport and then so when kate explained that you know she used to head the ball a lot in soccer and played for like her whole life basically and as soon as kate said that to the lady she goes that's it she goes, that's the problem. And then she said that you're actually lucky because um, she goes, you got very close to breaking your neck and um, it could have been way worse. And you've done a really great job of working around it and all this kind of stuff. And then she talked about like an energy block that she has um, at the bottom of her, um, like around her um, solar plexus and just all of this really amazing information and, and told her um, that she should see a osteopath. That would be the, the, like the, the way sort of thing. And, um, and we've been playing with some supplements as well, which is which have really helped, like some magnesium, high dose of magnesium, um, which has made a difference as well. So we're kind of making these little breakthroughs, and um, and she's starting to feel really good about it. And so I think that if we gave up on it, I don't think that the solution wouldn't have came to us. But I think because we've really both honestly, truly believe that there is a solution to her problem. Um, I think that because of that, I think that we've been able to unlock these things and we've stumbled across this lady who's been able to give us some guidance as well. And um, I think that's been very beneficial. So I think, yeah, in your case, I think that the first thing is having that belief that your body is self-healing and is self-regulating. And then the second thing is to what I call do no harm. So I think I always say this to everybody, you know, when a cat or a dog or an animal gets sick, the first thing they do is nothing. They don't eat, they don't drink, they don't do anything. They just go and lie in the corner until they heal. And so I always say to people, do no harm. That's got to be the first step. So you got to just, um, just step back from everything, eliminate everything. And then when you start to feel better, slowly start adding things back in. So that's where I think that the water fasting can be really great. Um, it resets all of your hormones. It allows your digestive system to reset itself. It um, changes the pH balance in your body as well. Like it can reestablish that. So if there's particularly some foods or some beverages or whatever it may be that, it, that you're consuming on a regular basis, even like coffee, you know, um, it can alter the pH balance and then that can um, create degeneration of certain areas. And um, so that could be a, an ongoing thing as well. So I think just pulling back and doing like a, even if you just did a 24 hour water fast. So I say to people like the best way to get started with a water fast is from dinner till dinner. So uh, have your normal day, have your, have your evening meal. And then say you eat at 6 p.m. And then nothing until 6 p.m. the next day. So that's the first step. And just try that because eight hours of that, you're sleeping anyway. So you're really only doing a 16-hour fast, you know, plus an eight-hour sleep. And then um, once you get through that, and that kind of unlocks a level in, in yourself where you say to yourself, that was actually pretty good and I feel pretty good. And then you can try again for a 36-hour. So that's where um, you would instead of going from dinner to dinner, you go from dinner, you skip the next dinner, sleep again, and then do the breakfast the following day. So you go a whole day of nothing. And then, so you eat the evening meal and go a whole day of nothing. And then you have breakfast the next day. And then you got your 36 hour fast. And then you can just kind of start to increase it like that. And you can literally go up to 14, 15, 30 days if you want of fasting. And I think this is 
the fastest way to heal that nobody wants to do. There's a guy that I read his book. His name's Nick Wood. Uh, Nick, no, sorry, Nick Good. And um, he was a professional rugby league player in the UK. And his dad and his brother both died of cancer. And it was very, very rapid. Um, when they found out about it, it just came on really fast and it killed them very fast. Mm -hmm. And then um, the same thing happened to him. He got cancer and he was diagnosed, I think, when he was in his early 30s. And they said to him, um, it was such a late stage at that point that they told him that he had three months to live. And so he just did not accept it. He went out to the jungle somewhere, like in Indonesia or something like that. And he just, um, he went on a fruit diet, a raw food diet, basically. He just had, he did water fasting as well. And so for three months, he just um, had water and fruit and vegetables, I assume, but just nothing cooked, just all raw food and uh, probably took plant medicine and stuff as well. And, um, and he healed himself and it's been, you know, that was like 30 years ago and now he's a healer and he's a, a health practitioner and, you know, he's a, he's a great, um, he's a great spiritual guide and um, teaches nutrition and just teaches how to heal the body. And um, just the experience that he had is so um, I think motivating because he was, you know, he was literally told you got three months to live mm. and he just, he just turned it around and now he surfs and he's got this, amazing bodies you know got six pack abs and it's in his like mid 50s now approaching 60 years old and just looks amazing long hair you know tan skin just incredible and um so i really believe that it, it doesn't it doesn't matter what your conditions are i believe that you can heal it you can turn it all around and i think it just comes down to finding the right practice and sometimes you know a spiritual guide like a like a um a, a a medium or a psychic healer or someone like that yeah. can, can really just put you on the right direction, you know, and just say, look, just look into the, these areas here. And then I think that can kind of trigger it. Um, but yeah, I think the first step, you know, square one is the belief going, going back to the belief and knowing that you can heal. Um, I think that we have this power that we don't tap into, which is our subconscious mind. So there's some great teachings that you probably enjoy. Um, his name's Neville Goddard. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but he's on YouTube. And this guy's from like the 1900s. I think he was born literally in 1900. And I think he died in the 1940s or 50s or something. But he's got all these lectures and he's, he's not a religious guy, but he uh, talks a lot about the Bible in terms of translating it. And what his belief is, is that, it's a lot about manifestation. And mm -hmm. he says that um, he says that the, the whole story of Jesus Christ and just God in general, it, it's, it is our subconscious. And he said, it's in everybody. He says that your subconscious mind is God and your conscious mind doesn't understand that. And when your conscious mind can understand that, then you can go into your subconscious mind and then you can assume what you want. And then that's when it is given to you. And so he says, like, I just assume everything. And he has all these amazing stories, like, and just little simple things as well as big, great things. But just one of the simple stories that he shared was he was living in New York City and there was this Broadway show. And this was like in the 20s or 30s or something. There was this Broadway show that was super popular, you know, and it was gets sold out in the first hour. And um, his brother came visiting from an, out of town, his brother and his partner or whatever. And they said, oh, we'd love to go to, um, you know, a Broadway theater um, show and, and see this particular show. Uh, but it's probably sold out. And then so Neville was like, no, no, don't worry. We'll, we'll go. I'll, I'll make sure we got tickets right at the front. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And then he's like, no, no, no we'll, we'll go. And so um, he left it literally. To, he didn't even buy the tickets. He didn't even bother. He, he just went on the day of the show in line to go and buy the tickets like an hour before the show started. And even the sign said sold out and everything. And he's like, don't worry, don't worry. It's fine. So they were in this, in this line, this big log line waiting to get to the thing to the, you know, the cashier or whatever. And they get to the front cashier. And, um, and then just as he was about to step up to the cashier, this man just cut in front of him and, um, and said, and basically just pushed in and bought um, and ordered two tickets to some show or whatever and like some random show. And so the, um, the cashier served him, but, and it was meant to be um, $40. And instead of the guy giving two $20 bills, he gave two $1 bills. And I don't know if it was trying to scam him or if it was an accident or whatever, but um, Neville noticed that it was, it was, 
that what he'd done. And then the, the cashier looked at it at the last minute and the guy had already taken his tickets and walked off. And then um, just as, as the guy was looking at the money, Neville called out to the guy and he's like, hey, hey, mister, hey. He's like, he goes, you gave him two ones. He goes, you, you meant to give him two 20s. And then the guy like just stopped and then he walked back and he actually gave out the gave the guy two 20s. So that's why I wasn't sure if it was an accident or not, but either way, he he sorted it out. And so the cashier realized that Neville helped him. And so then Neville went up to the to the thing and he's like, oh, what can I do for you? And then he's like, oh, I'd like four tickets to so-and-so. And then he's like, oh, he's like, I've got some special ones just for you. And then he went, I opened up a drawer and he pulled out an envelope and he goes, oh, we save these um, a couple of seats at the front row for celebrities and, you know, politicians and stuff like that. He's like, here you go. And gave them to him. And like he said that leading into it, that the whole time, he just assumed that he would get the front row tickets. And so what he does, he has this process where he just sits down and he visualizes it. So he just goes through his mind where he goes there, he lines up, he pays for it. He gets the tickets. He gets the seats that he wants and everything just happens the way he wants it to happen. And he just has the assumption and he goes into the feeling of assuming that that's how it's all going to play out. And then once he, once he connects the feeling and the visualization together, then he just lets it go and he doesn't worry about it anymore. And he says, that's the process. And it's easier said than done. It takes a bit of practice and it's something that I work on and I try to do in my life all the time. And, um, and he just somehow has managed to master it and he teaches it and he does all these lectures. And what he does is um, when he was doing his lectures, the way he would convince people, because people would be very skeptical and he'd be like, okay, he goes, so I want you to try a little experiment. He goes, when you go home tonight, he goes, when you go, he goes for the next seven days, when you go to bed, I want you to lie down, close your eyes. And I want you to visualize climbing a ladder. And he goes, that's all you got to do. He goes, you just got to climb up a ladder. He goes, just imagine yourself, watch yourself, visualize yourself, feel yourself climbing up a ladder. He said, but in that seven days, no matter what happens, don't climb a ladder. Like don't actually climb a ladder in real life. But I want you to visualize it every night. He goes, but no matter what happens, do not climb a ladder. And then he goes, and within the seven days, if you find yourself up a ladder, come to my seminar. And then so, um, and so these people do it and then, they don't even, they don't even think about it. And then, you know, they go over to their friend's house or whatever. And, you know, their friends saying, Oh, Hey, can you just help me fix this thing? And next thing you know, they're up a ladder and they're like, Oh, I wasn't meant to climb a ladder. And um, so then they go to the seminar and they say, Hey, like that work, that's crazy. You know, this is what happened. And then he, and then he always says to them, he goes, well, if you can, if you can do something as simple as climbing a ladder, he goes, why can't you make a million dollars? Why can't you, you know, heal your body of the illnesses that you have? Why can't you make yourself walk again? All this kind of stuff. And like, that's how he kind of makes believers out of people. And then he goes deeper into the theories of it. So yeah, Neville Goddard is someone who I recommend that I think will be very beneficial as well. I'm going to um, check that out. Yeah. And I can also pass the details on to you of the, um, that's um, psychic medium that Kate spoke to this week. Cause I think that she was quite amazing as well. Wow. Yeah, actually, uh, I am a, I'm a paranormal investigator. Oh, wow. And, and we have a psychic that works on our team. Brilliant. So it's, it's just weird that you brought that up. That, that's yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so real quick, let's say there's someone out there and they say, oh, Jai seems like a real cool guy, but I don't want to do all that exercise stuff, but I need I need help. Do you do you help those folks as well? Definitely. So um, I like to work with people who don't know how to get started, who aren't quite sure what to do. And I'm, I take them from square one all the way through and, and everything is customized to the individual as to what they need. And so for most people, it doesn't start with exercise. It usually just starts with walking. So it's about creating a process, a daily process that empowers you. So I have a morning process that I go through and that's what I like to start people on. I like to get people to create a morning process where they wake up at a specific time. You know, we have to challenge ourselves in some way and it doesn't necessarily have to be with heavy weights in a gym. It could just be waking up an hour earlier. I could be doing a 5am wake up, you know, joining the 5am club where you get up in the morning and you walk the dog. Um, and so little things like that. So I create a process for people based on where they're at, just to get those little wins in the, in the morning, when you, when you can stack those little wins in the morning, then that empowers you to want to do more. And that always happens with everybody. They start off doing little things and then they want more it becomes, they get encouraged. So, um, the morning process 
you know, generally for everybody, it should look something along the lines of, and this is for anybody who does want to get started with something and not sure where to start. Morning process is where you need to look. So you wake up a little bit earlier than what you normally would. Maybe you're an early bird anyway. Um, and then you hydrate. And um, there might be some kind of supplementation that makes you feel good, something that's been beneficial for you. Maybe it's a magnesium, maybe it's some activated charcoal, uh, you know, whatever it might be, or it could just be water. So it's, uh, it's the first thing is hydrate. And then the second thing is to, I call it wisdom in, intentions out. So wisdom in meaning grab a book. So I've got some amazing, amazing books that don't take up a lot of my time. They're just little quote books. And uh, one of them, which I'm sure that you've seen and heard of is the Tao Te Ching, which is a very popular book by Lao Tzu. And, uh, you know, a book like this, it just has passages where you don't have to read the whole thing. You just open it up to any one page and it, and it always ends up being insightful and valuable. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, there's all these other different types of books that you can get that just have literally one quote per page from a different person and it's just inspirational so um, a couple of pages of wisdom in something that makes you just ponder and gets your mind activated and then in intentions out so that's where you get your journal and then you either write your intentions for the day you know my my three intentions for today are to you know get outside and get some sunlight you know um maybe do 10,000 steps and maybe, you know, drink some more water today or, or eat healthier or, or not have so much coffee or not drink alcohol or not take drugs or whatever it may be. And um, so intentions out and then um, maybe some affirmations as well, or maybe you just like to journal, you know, that maybe whatever the therapeutic um, way of expressing something outwardly is best for you is what I think you should do. So for me, I like to write, my intentions and affirmations. So one of my affirmations, which I think is beneficial for everybody and it's to heal the body and to stay healthy forever is um, the affirmation is I'm so grateful for my healthy body and my awesome long life. So it's again, going back to the Neville Goddard theory, it's the assumption. So mm -hmm. rather than um, rather than begging for something, I'm assuming something. So rather than saying, dear God, please heal me or dear God, please give me, you know, something like, you know, health or whatever. I just say, thank you. I'm so grateful for my healthy body. I'm so grateful for my long life. And I think that the feeling that you get from being thankful for something is very different to yes. the feeling of begging and asking for something. Cause when you're asking from it, again, the subconscious mind then assumes that it's something that you don't have. So now you're vibrating at a frequency of, of the lack of the thing that you don't have. And that will actually push you further away from the thing that you want. Even if you don't have that thing, if you don't feel like you have a perfect health and, a, and an awesome long life by saying it and just feeling that, which is hard to not feel it when you say it, then it just changes your frequency. And then that's the healing frequency. So having those affirmations and intentions, I think are important. And then that's, that's the next stage. And then after that, I have a 60 second, I call it the morning pump. And so this is where you do 60 seconds of a basic body weight exercise that's at your level, not with the intentions of, getting stronger and losing weight or anything like that more to activate your brain to get the oxygen flowing through your your blood so mm -hmm. that you are empowered so for me i do burpees which is you know it's a hard exercise but for most people it could just be um star jump, you know jumping jacks or it could be squats or it could be some push-ups off the, the bench you know just some push-ups off the kitchen table just something for 60 seconds that's going to get your heart rate elevated get the oxygen flowing through the 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 blood and activate that those brain cells and get you firing and that puts you in a positive state because when you're doing something physical, you can't really be in a negative state while you're physically working your body. You know, you're in an empowered state. Like nobody gets anxiety while they're running a marathon. So it's, it's about getting that into that state. And then that's the, that's the morning process. Once you do that, then you can go on into your work or into the daily activities that you need to do. So that's how I like to start people off. And then of course, the other thing is diet. Diet is very important. So the best thing to do is to just, to manage it. So I say that you, um, you know, you have to manage it in order to be able to, to control it. And um, the way to do that is to just um, figure out what the best calories are for your body based on your height, your age, your weight. You can just type it into a calculator on Google. Um, what are, you know, what's my um, 
I type in macro calculator and then it'll just ask you the questions and then it'll tell you the best calories for you to have on a daily basis are X, Y, Z. You know, so for most people, it's going to be somewhere between 1500 calories up to maybe 2400 calories, depending on your height and age and weight. And um, whatever that is, just stick to that. There's apps like MyFitnessPal that are free. And you just punch in the food that you're eating every day. And then that just starts to record it. And then you can do a whole day's worth of food of just logging everything that you put in there. And then it'll give you a report and it'll say, oh, you ate 2000 calories today. And, and then you can go back and say, oh, well, I was only meant to have 1500 calories today. And so that's where you start the process of making those adjustments. So yeah, so you, you can't manage what you're not measuring. And most people aren't measuring their diet. So I think that's a, a great way to start as well. So measuring um, those calories and even if you don't change even if you're eating the same food just measure everything out in terms of like just get an idea of what's going inside your body um and and that's the morning process and then from there you just refine 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 and you know when you have a coach in your corner and they can kind of see you in the right direction as to you know how to approach it what are the best things to do how to move your body right um what foods are going to be beneficial what supplements are going to be beneficial it just fast tracks everything and when you commit to something like that committing to getting seeking help from a, an external source then that is showing your subconscious mind that this is important to you, that your health is important. It's an act of self-love. And so I think that's why it's a, it's a great thing to be coached or to, you know, go and, you know, chiropractors, osteopaths, physiotherapy, all of this stuff, personal training. I think it's all a very great way for you to tell yourself that you are worth it. And what are your website and your social media? So I'm on Instagram. That's where I document my life. So if you want to see my morning process, I mm. put that out there every single day so people can kind of catch on to what I'm doing and my workouts. And that's uh, my Instagram handle is sq1fitnessaus. And my website is sq1fitness.com.au where you can see my programs and you can get in contact with me there. But they're the best two places to kind of see what's going on with my life and what I can offer for people. Thank you so much for your time. And when I get to Australia, I'm going to look you up. 100%, dude. That would be awesome. <laughs> But yeah, and I also want to thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. I'd love to see you come back from my regulars. I appreciate y'all because you make it possible for me to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.